Bonsoir tout le monde. On va commencer. Good evening, everyone. We're going to start this meeting of the Standing Committee on Strategies and Public Policies. This is a meeting where we do not make decisions. We listen to people who present. And it'll be a good background for further discussions. So we're going to start uh, with the presentation of vulnerable populations. Mr. Richard. Thank you. Uh, good evening, councillors. The first presentation on vulnerable populations uh, is a return from last summer for the uh, the sector leisure sector that we talked about. So it's a vulnerable population we're going to talk about. We've had discussions with uh, people, uh, the person who's read is presenting tonight and and uh, we'll have a time for a reflection for you tonight. Chantal Lozier is going to present uh, tonight. Good evening, uh, Ms. Lozier. Thanks for inviting me this evening. My business, you know, research and analysis is in Dieppe and I also live in Dieppe. And that's why I want to present on vulnerable populations. I don't want to give you a presentation as much, but I want to exchange my opinions with you and ask you if you really think there's a vulnerable population in Dieppe. My first argument is that uh, the city of Dieppe is a wonderful place, but we also have a lot of vulnerable people. In your opinion, who are the most vulnerable people in Dieppe? Thank you for this question. So who are vulnerable people in Dieppe? It's not always visible. We have homeless people lying down on a park bench, but we can have some in all families in all situations. And I see uh, the little men you have here. We have people with special needs, etc. And we see families, and we see people here that is uh, pushing a baby carriage. Uh, we have a single parent families. So we have all these people that we could call vulnerable. To answer your question, Mark, there's not really a good answer. For this exchange between us, we'll find a definition, however. Mark mentioned a few populations that could be vulnerable, but now I want to ask you why you think those people are vulnerable. Melissa. Could you tell me why you think the people that Mark mentioned could be vulnerable? I can't remember who he mentioned, but I can imagine that some people would have trouble finding a housing or services, especially for them. So general services can be hard to access sometimes. 
That's interesting because we never really targeted one person or population. And you're talking about situations. You talked about housing and you talk about single parent families. So we haven't even looked at the population yet, just situations. There is not a real vulnerable population in India only people that are in vulnerable situations. For example, we have a child, uh, one of the parents goes to prison and the child goes into a foster home. That child was okay, but it's the situation he's going through that makes them vulnerable. vulnerable. And a person who has uh, mobility problems, and then this person's spouse goes to the hospital. So now this person becomes vulnerable. To define the population that is vulnerable is difficult to define. I started the research by trying to define a vulnerable population, but it depends on the situation in which the people Fall. Jean-Marc looks in good shape. He goes to Colombia. He's kidnapped. That's a vulnerable situation, but he was okay before he was kidnapped. So Jean-Marc, uh, we don't know if you're going to come back, but I hope so. So you see, it's the situation that makes a person vulnerable. For example, public health could indicate that within potential groups, uh, some people would be vulnerable uh, uh, with respect to cl climatic change, uh, perhaps uh, the person is 75 years old or, or more or under five years. Uh, so this could be a, a situation of vulnerability. COVID-19 has many consequences and we're still going through it for the long term. So COVID is a situation and people became vulnerable at homeless people or people in seniors homes as well. We saw all the problems we've had, uh, drug addicts and uh, women who have suffered uh, domestic abuse or people who are working at uh, low salaries in, in uh, restaurants or other places, they became vulnerable. In your opinion, what situations could make a citizen a vulnerable in Dieppe? If uh, tomorrow morning we would have uh, no transportation, uh, people, citizens couldn't get to where they're going, of course from one day to another in Dieppe. If we had a big fire, or it could be a, a climate uh, situation, uh, a population from one day to the next could become vulnerable. Paula, do you have examples? Maybe somebody who depends on somebody to go grocery shopping or to the bank or, and the person becomes ill. That person would be more vulnerable. So we'll see any situations that come to mind. The loss of a job. after this uh, pandemic, uh, and now we've got inflation. They still have a revenue, but it's not increasing. So people are becoming more vulnerable in that sense. An environment as well. If we had a tragedy, a forest fire or some other event come in. So the change in a person's life too, loss of a spouse or a mental health problem or any change uh, 
in a situation that could cause vulnerable vulnerability. So it could be the population, the whole population that could become a vulnerable. Yes, the whole population could be vulnerable. Jamak went to Colombia and he was kidnapped. It can happen to anybody. He wasn't vulnerable until he went to Colombia. And for leisure services to determine the vulnerable population to offer services, the first step would be to target groups or population in the municipality in uh, with respect to its uh, leisure master plan. We would have children and youth zero to 18 years old or people 19 years or older or people with reduced mobility. So we have to target the population. The next step would be to determine situations that could make those groups more vulnerable. Like we talked about mental health, but uh, good health uh, could uh, make people more vulnerable. Access to transportation, a social network, revenue, responsibilities as well. The third step was just to develop indicators to determine the situation of vulnerability for the leisure services in its master plan. For DF, it's uh, pro-youth uh, children from 2 to 18 years old. We have three criteria and the key indicators, we have a list here that determine Look, I don't know if we have to answer to all these indicators. I think perhaps a few. So if a child uh, lives in a situation that makes him more vulnerable, then it would be first step, the public and uh, indicate the, uh, the targets. We've had uh, a few data to show you how uh, the population is uh, set up 0 to 14, 15 to 64, and 65 years and older. 15 to 64 is the majority, and the medium age is 40, and the medium age of the population, median, is 40. I'm not an economist, but I think this is a little bit too high. For a private families, for the size, uh, if we have one or two people and the number of people in a, a home, private home, so it's 2.4, that's very low. That could be an indicator for leisure services. If we have families that has an average of four in the family, then we could include them in the master plan for youth. So this is my presentation. Is it a bit more clear for you between a vulnerable population or vulnerable situation? Do you have any questions? Ms. Kanbu, yes, very interesting. And I was wondering, when you look at this vulnerability situations, are there any statistics that can help us? Like which populations have a tendency to get us into that type of situation, like financial vulnerability, for example, like a group of uh, the population that would have a tendency to be in that situation. Yes, it's qualitative and not quantitative, and those are the de determinants on the health website. The first one being the revenue, salaries, and a professional situation. I didn't uh, bring out this data 
but it could help you and you can uh, check the statistics because with the salaries there it has an influence on all the other determining factors like education race culture etc there are 13 in all and they influence each other and up on the top is the revenue of course uh, that would be a good part to check out any other questions no questions thank you for this exchange that uh, we've had thanks for participating the next uh, presentation is the Diet Military Veterans Association, Nils Lidgemark and Keith Brewer. Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, everyone. I'm Niels Ligemark, and I'm president of the Dieppe Military Vet Veterans Association. With me tonight, Mr. Keith Brewer is a director and our webmaster who does everything with our computers. For those who do not know us, we're an organization that we created 19, this was 179 and incorporated in 83 with a constitution and bylaws. We have 128 members. We were 129, we just lost one last week. And I'm sorry, but I did not change the figures you see posted. Our mandate is to ensure that the Veterans Day be commemorated here in Dieppe. All the cities have their own cenotaph and Dieppe does not have one. Ours was built in 81 and we commemorate the Veterans Day here in Dieppe since that day. We have the responsibility of the well-being of veterans in here, Dieppe, Moncton and Riverview. Our members uh, sometimes come from outside. Our veterans uh, are kept in touch with all our services and benefits we have, and, and we support Cadets 3006 here in Dieppe. Excuse me, I have to check my notes. This is our, is a place where we have a ceremony. Is it part Gilles Laurie Cormier? Oh, and uh, we do our ceremonies here. We have two photos of this park. Like I mentioned, we support cadets with bursaries uh, and uh, trips, expenses, and all instruments that they need. We buy them. Drums and uh, chimes that they play. And we so we take care of all that. And if they travel as well, we pay part of their trip. If they go on a trip, we give them $600. We also give to uh, families of uh, uh, veterans that have died a, a ceremony uh, that is good for the family and the family appreciates it. We also have monthly meetings to update all our veterans 
and socialize a little bit with our colleagues. Because of COVID, since 2021, we have not had monthly meetings, but we still keep in touch. We haven't had any uh, financing campaigns. And those who know us, uh, if you saw this in the Champlain Mall, uh, there's a, always a guy selling tickets and we haven't done it for two years now when we've asked them if we could do it this year, but we're not certain because every time a client comes, we would have to, to clean a pen and clean the counter. So we're waiting. We started our meetings again and we have invited guests that talked to us for 10 or 15 minutes on interesting subjects for our veterans. I'm getting lost here. Oh, that one. We're continuing this year with our ceremonies for Remembrance Day for the Battle of the Atlantic D-Day, and uh, we join uh, in a region for other ceremonies, a D-Day. We have suppers each year, but we haven't done it this year because we usually have it in May. But with COVID, things are sure. Uh, we have it at the Dieppe Golden Age Club where we have our ceremonies and we have a supper, but they're not really ready to host us yet. And we have a Christmas dinner each year and uh, we gather um, little animals, uh, stuffed toys for children for Christmas presents. In the past, we, we corrected an error with the money in Canada we, on the Toonie. It was on the Dieppe raid and they called it uh, Bataille Dieppe in French. So we corrected this error with uh, Ms. Petipot Taylor and Mr. Melanson, and they annulled, they canceled this toonie and made another one. And now we have the, this emblem here on our shoulders. As well, with the support of the city of Dieppe, We have made banners at the uh, Lori Comier Park of 12 of our veterans. But if you go to Shediac, the two weeks before Remembrance Day, you'll see these everywhere. And we want to celebrate uh, November 11th with our deceased uh, veterans. But we just need funds. We have the will but we need money. Our challenge for 2020 or 2022 will be the unveiling of a monument, a, a plaque that was offered to us. During one of our meetings of the Dieppe raid, we had a visit from General Dallaire and we had a little supper at uh, the Golden Age Club. He said to me, we would like to give you a plaque. One of our 
ships saved 95 Canadians that were in the water at Dieppe during the raid. So we want to give you a plaque to commemorate that. We'll put it on the cenotaph, perhaps. I said, thank you for honoring, honoring us. And then I received another call and some emails. The plaque is 24 by 26 inches. It, uh, we can't place it on the cenotaph. So it didn't work that way. The cenotaph was too small. But then he said there was a monument just beside it. We could do the same thing. We could have a black granite uh, monument and put the plaque on top of it. So I called the city, I talked to a few people, and they said they find a place. But on, underneath, there's a lot of pipes that are going underground. So finally they said, well, we don't have any place for it. But they took out a part of something that was there. So we're going to put it there and on the left-hand side of the cenotaph. And then I said, okay, so... And the ambassador of Poland and the consul general will come too. And 20 Marines will come as well as long as well as people in the military. It's quite a plaque. So I said, just a minute, we're not ready for that. Um, your worship wouldn't, uh, our mayor, his worship wouldn't be there. The consul was in France. So they said, well, make our own program. And I said, no, no, no. We'll have a program, with them we'll unveil the plaque. So I sent him a, uh, an email, and I haven't heard anything since. So I think their priorities are not really there, and I haven't heard anything since. So that's our challenge. What is going on with that? We don't know. So are I are there any questions on that? And I could answer your questions if you wish. Are there any questions? Councillor Brido, thank you. Your, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Lillamark. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, I like uh, to uh, participate with your organization. And I was talking to Mr. Buckley from Bristol just before Christmas, because they know we have a delegation in, that comes from Dieppe and they try to organize at, with representatives of the city because they want a special activity for our veterans. The problem is, uh, Mayor Mark said that we don't know based on Dieppe scheduling how it will work if we have time to get to Gimmi, but it's still, it, it's a few hours of drive. Uh, so the, the, those people are interested that, that they've uh, stated uh, with respect to our uh, group of Canadians and Acadians who are beyond the ground. So I would imagine that we could have a uh, sit down for a moment and, and uh, see if we can organize things. As you presented, it's not obvious for your group when there's nobody who's here to host those people. That's how it ends up. I'm going to try to contact Jeanette Pettipa Taylor and I hope that she'll come. I'm going to try to speak to our prime minister, our premier. We'll see if it's possible. And uh, maybe otherwise another MP or, well, listen, if I can help you in this situation or uh, to offer you some support, it would be my pleasure, Mr. Uh, Jamark. Uh, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Brideau. Councillor uh, Turgeon, thank you, Deputy, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. It was very educational. I learned a lot about your role and your, the, your mandate. You mentioned that the uh, 11th of November ceremony, you're saying that you're trying to lack in, in funding. 
I think it's based on the fact that you haven't been able to do any fundraising. So how much uh, have you lost in the last two years? Well, usually we collect around twelve to thirteen thousand dollars a year uh, when we rate for our fundraising. Uh, this goes for the scholarships. We have four scholarships that we give. We had five, but one of our f former, well, he's not yet deceased, but he's not doing great. Dr. Brian Newbold, he's an honorary member and offered to offer a $500 scholarship uh, uh, annually, but uh, he's not showing up for the last two years and his health, it, it's really it taken a hit. So we're not pushing him. It's, it's great for, it goes towards uh, scholarships and to help and also for our veterans and to pay for the small things that we do, our regimentary dinner, our Christmas dinner. That's where the money goes. So, so the fundraising that you do, the tractor and the snowblower, that's what you were doing. That's your only fundraiser that was that brought you $14,000? Yes, between twelve and 14000 depending on the year. Our best year was 17000 and it was by far our best year. So is it having an impact on your November 11th ceremony? No, no, not at all. Because we haven't done anything in two past two years. We had we had little ceremonies. We paid for it. Uh, the the it was at the arts cultural arts center. It didn't cost us very much. We continue to do the ceremony nonetheless. Uh, the legions cut them. Actually, they didn't do any ceremonies. So thank you very much. Madam Councillor Boudreau, really great presentation. Thank you so much. It's very interesting. Now, I was wondering how we could help you to continue to educate the population in general terms, in terms of your man, your, your mission, and to support you in terms to uh, continue to educate young people so that we don't forget history uh, behind all this. Well, the week of the uh, November 11th, the previous week and uh, November 11th, we go in the schools and we speak to uh, school age children. We explain, it's not uh, in dark terms, but we explain why we're so free uh, and the uh, benefits that we receive. And it's uh, thanks to our veterans, it's to educate them a little bit. In the school books, there's not much on the great wars. The first, it's just dates. It hasn't changed since I was uh, uh, knee high to a grasshopper. Uh, we do what we can. I noticed that there's lots of schools. They're doing great work in my pocket, in my uh, left blazer po pocket. I said I can't forget this. I have a 10 cent piece. I was at uh, one of the uh, schools. Whoa. This is a bit of chemo fog here, sorry. I'm still uh, taking uh, cancer treatments. Not the Maguire. Um, the, where you, it's the fork or to the left or right? McLaughlin. I knew it started like that. Like there's a school there. So I went to the school and I did I made a presentation to the kids. And we were outside and we raised the flag. We laid a, we laid a wreath. And I was holding the door for the children coming in, little little kids. And a little blonde one said, Monsieur, and she, she said, I, I put up my hand, it's all I have, and then she left. I looked, it was a 10 cent, and then she was gone. I put it in my pocket, and I'll be, I'll be buried with that 10, 10 cent piece. I always have it with me. So it's little things like that, it will help. Uh, we'll try to be more active uh, with our bulletin and our, uh, our newsletter and other things. We don't, we don't have, there's not so many citizens who come to our presentation when we do our ceremonies, especially here in Dieppe, but there's some. It's increasing. I see that it's increasing. I've been doing this for 12 or 14 years. I've been president. At the start, there was the wives and the husbands of, and the families of our uh, veterans. And now we see lots of citizens who come. To our parades and our ceremonies it helps a lot and even for the immigrants coming in it would be nice for them to know the the, the story of why we're called the app here in new brunswick thank you very much yes well yes we, we did a presentation to young people who were here from france 
they were uh, really they really found our cenotaph wonderful and it's and it has to spread that that way uh, as well Madame thank you madam uh le boutier well it's basically uh roughly what i was uh, uh, same kind of comments as councillor Pedro. i have participated in uh, lots of them and it's always well done thank you for all your involvement it's really important these are things that as as you were mentioning we have to communicate these things we owe people this respect to ensure that it continues on our end we have facebook we have a website as well www.diep-veterans.org vets.org everything's there photos gosh well since we started 1914 2014 2014 we started that tons of information we also use facebook so on social media we're active thanks to thanks to the boss thank you uh, councillor brido thank you again uh, uh mr thibodeau you spoke of your uh, fundraising campaigns that you do you you're still selling the veterans uh, license plate i just invite my colleagues to buy the license plate it's a lovely license plate you can place it in front of your car uh, it's a way to support our veterans as well i i i, I put it up here Ah, uh, there's an S. You're missing an S on your HTTP. You need to add. It's HTTPS. We're secured. We're uh, security is important for us because we were both in communications. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. So, thank you very much for your presentation, and especially thank you for the work that you're doing with the association. It's very important to be able to gather and meet between former between veterans and to have and be able to exchange like this and also with the municipal council thank you for the invitations that you always send to participate in your activities well I hope that there will be you won't all be in France for our ceremony on the uh, regarding the dip parade the mayor and two councillors will be there good the others will be here uh, we're anxious to see you there. Oh, it's a, it'd be a pleasure to see you then. Is that, is that it? Yes. Well, thank you very much then. Well, now the next presentation is the Lambdor Skating Club of Dieppe, Madame Christine Levesque. Uh, inaudible. Good evening, Madame Levesque. I'm used to speaking to 25 or 30 adolescents. Yeah, uh, you're, you're teenagers at heart, I suppose. It's You're so much more quiet. So, I am the president of the uh, Dieppe Skating Club, Lame d'Or. It's my first uh, year as president. Before, I was vice president administrator, but our uh, 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 president, uh, our ex-president, uh, she was eight there for seven, eight, nine years, and she passed the torch, and I got the position in in full pandemic in the midst of the pandemic. You might say it was a big challenge in and of itself. We, I would say, were the biggest. Well, I'm not sure if, if of, of of that, but we're the one of the largest skating clubs in the province i think fredericton is close to us but i think they're i think we're the biggest uh uh figure skating club in the province when i say figure skating it's also the club for learning how to skate that is our mandate basically 
were a nonprofit organization, were managed by uh, volunteers. Our executive, I won't go into details, but we have 10 members of our executive. Our trainers, compared to other sports, our trainers are employees. So the trainers are paid by the club. They're paid during the, the uh, for can skate. Uh, they're paid for the private lessons for our members that continue in uh, figure skating. So it's different, if you will, than traditional sports where uh, uh, volunteers uh, manage. You see in our uh, presentation that we do have volunteer trainers, but we have five trainers that are paid by the club uh, based on the number of hours that they do a week. We offer a variety of programs whether it be to learn how to skate and even uh, up to figure skating for for, uh, com, uh, pedi com, for competition or recreation as well. We also have adult figure skating. We have a large group, about 20 adults, who do figure skating with us, oftentimes former uh, skaters who continue when they're adults. We also have people who started. We have two young students from University of Moncton. They decided to jump, make the jump to figure skating, uh, the six levels of skate, can skate, and then they join the adult levels. It's lovely to see. Those people can also participate in some uh, competitions and at uh, skate New Brunswick level. Our mandate uh, for the figure, for the skating club is to allow uh, who uh, anyone to learn how to skate and throughout their life, whether it be for fun, to stay in shape, or to achieve for uh, special achievement achievements. That's why we have to offer a wide range of programs that allow people uh, for us to achieve that mandate and to allow to us to offer that to the public. Our members, the most of our members are part of uh, Scanscape groups. Uh, this year among our 300 members, I think we are 325 members. Uh, far more than half were part of the can skate group. Uh, this this is the autumn and winter and spring season. We offer three seasons a year. Each participant must pay a uh, membership with uh, Skate Canada once a year, and that's how we calculate the number of members in our club. Um, in the uh, figure skating a group that on the competitive level, even recreationally, it's about 75 young people, teenagers, and and and, and adults. The rest are our children who are part of the Canscape program. We serve a lot of newcomers. More and more in the past few years, we see that newcomers are interested in our programs to learn how to skate. Their reasons uh, when we speak with them is that. They want to be part of our culture, and skating is part of who we are in New Brunswick. Also, we're partners with uh, Pro Youth, as most of our uh, organizations are in DF. Also, we were asked to, to discuss our achievements in 2021, 2022. I think that a major achievement was to maintain are the number of members, our high number of, of members, even with the pandemic, like any other organized sport, 2021, 2022 was a hard year. I won't go into the budget. We have a huge bu deficit is $20,000 $20, for 21, 2022, because we needed to limit our groups, our can the size of our can skate groups. Instead of 60 per groups, we had 20. And can skate, that's where we bring in a lot of our financing to uh, make our other programs work. And you know, with the uh, price of the ice, it's expensive. Ice time, rather, it's expensive. As, as opposed to hockey groups or figure skating groups, we have far fewer participants on the ice. So the uh, ice time is expensive. And that's how we charge, we charge it to our members. But our success with can skate is such that we can keep our rates affordable. If we, we always compare to it with Moncton and Fredericton, and we off the better, the best 
ice time to price ratio with the other services that we offer, the off ice uh, courses, yoga courses. We do have a good program. Another success, we allow uh, Bria, uh, Dieppe to shine. We send uh, skaters to provincial competitions. We sent one skater to Regina this year to the uh, Canadian Challenge, young uh, Veronique Buddy. She went to Regina in November. She qualified here, and then she went to Re no, Regina in November. We've, we had athletes, a sister of uh, Veronique went to the last Canada Games. Alex and Estelle went to the Canadian Championships. The Canadian Championships were all our Olympians start. So they went uh, in the dance division in 2020. These are great achievements and we're proud to represent Dieppe throughout the country. One of our adult skaters, she went to Innsbruck, participated in an international competition. So that's uh, uh, how we uh, spread, uh, make uh, Dieppe uh, shine. So uh, one of our trainers was coaches was uh, chose chosen for the Canada Games uh, uh, 2023. Linda LeBlanc will go along will so accompany the New Brunswick team in February uh, 2023. And one of our major successes is that the CanSkate program enables our young people to give back to the community by doing volunteer work. So our skaters, in addition to being on the ice. At seven, eight, nine hours a week, they offer their time on Sunday afternoons and Wednesday nights to teach skating to young people uh, during can skate lessons. This is a major achievement when young people can give back to their community. I think that's something that's important. It's important to mention uh, um, how lucky we are to train in Dieppe. The collaboration between the various associations, and uh, now I'm speaking of the arenas, whether it's with the uh, Hockey Diet Member Cook with Ringette or speed skating, uh, there's great collaboration. Often there are events, it's, it could be last minute or changes, and people are always ready to uh, 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 trade ice time and uh, do some uh, sacrifices so that other clubs can offer uh, competitions or tournaments. For example, this year, uh, Skate New Brunswick uh, announced their competition a bit later, given COVID. And we didn't have a chance to make the request for ice time because our requests for ice time are done in June for the uh, competitions next year. At any rate, we did nonetheless uh, su succeed because uh, thanks to the collaboration, to getting nice time that we wanted and to offer a figure skating uh, competition at the Uniplex, it's fantastic. With the systems, the screens, the young people saw themselves on the big screen. It's you know on the kiss and cry when they get their uh, results. You see them on the great screen at the Uniplex. It was really wonderful. The Olympic sized surface allows us to offer a uh, can skate. Uh, with 60 young people on the ice. Uh, the Uniplex, the NHL size ice surfaces allow our athletes to train on ice surfaces that are that look a lot like the national uh, competition ice surfaces. And uh, also um, weight training uh, with the addition of the uh, sala of, uh, assumption room. Uh, it has really helped us with uh, our training regimens. Our challenges and our objectives for the upcoming season. So we just finished our season, our spring season. We are offering a summer camp in the month of August for four weeks. Our challenge just for 2022, 2023, we hope to keep up the, the development of uh, different uh, athletes of various levels to ensure that development we encourage continuous uh, uh, education with our trainers. We try to help them financially as much as we can. National level uh, courses uh, in figure skating aren't offered just anywhere. So they often have to travel to Ottawa or out west. So these are trainings that are expensive. Two of our coaches are nationally certified. And that means that they can accompany athletes to comp higher level competitions. 
we work a lot on inclusion in all of our programs. We're seeing more and more young people with special needs who come participate in our courses, whether it be uh, physical needs, whether it be intellectual needs. Our volunteers take the time to discuss with parents, even the young people. We see that, see that inclusion is important. I think it's innate in young uh, adolescents today, and we, we see that work happen a lot offering a high quality program while maintaining affordable fees. We want our, we want to hope that our member, we want our member to feel uh, comfortable financially, like any other association, the pre parents prepare, they, they drop the budget. Uh, and certainly at the cost of ice time uh, uh, for youth from September to May, it helps us a lot. In the summer, it's a bit more expensive. We understand uh, that's how it works. But certainly, the city helps us out a lot. The city helped us out a lot when we set up with the harness and other equipment at the U Uniplex. We thank you greatly for that. Another uh, objective, we want to prepare our athletes for the Canada Games. Uh, right now, we have four or five training to, for, to try to qualify for that competition. And another one, uh, one of another, uh, another objective that we have is to offer a learn to skate program for uh, those uh, uh, with little vision. Uh, uh, so we were approached and see if it, it, if it was, if, if our coaches were interested. We tried, uh, again, the pandemic until the summer, it was stop and start. Until the winter, rather, it was stop and start. We didn't concentrate on it so much. But for the fall, our coaches are trying to prepare themselves and see how. And if we put them on the same line surfaces as, as can skate. So those are, that is one of our objectives for the next season. I think I spoke fast. Uh, that's it. So if you have any questions. Are there any questions for Madame Levesque? Levesque, rather. I don't see anybody with any questions. So it was clear. It's like at school. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting to see everything that your club is doing for the citizens of Dieppe. It's our 50th anniversary this year as well. Congratulations. We had our banquet last year, last week. It's our 50th anniversary. It was in 1972 that Lambdo, the Lambdo Club was established. It's a club that's operating well. It's uh, going well. People are used to it. If we can maintain our, keep our reasonably priced ice times and ice fees and keep people for can skate. And we don't, if we don't always have to give our ice time to hockey member and cook, we should be all right. Uh, thank you and good night. So our next presentation is Hockey Dieppe Member Cook with Christian Bosset and Serge Bosset. Hello, hello, sirs. Are you doing? Are you doing well? Hello, bonjour. Hello, as my name is Serge Bourgeois. I'm the technical director of Hockey Member Cook. This is my partner, Christian Bosset. He's the executive director of Hockey Dieppe Member Cook. As you see, we're not the best at doing presentations. Uh, on, on, this, on the rink, I can talk to a lot of people. A lot of people here, it's a bit harder. Serge, can you talk a little closer, more into the mic? for the translator's benefit. No problem. So Hockey Memory Cook develops young people in, in the region for a, a, a large number of years, offering organized sport in a safe environment where they can develop, learn teamwork and develop their level of confidence. And this will follow them for the rest of their life. Christian and myself, we always add to that while make, maintaining uh, registration fees low for our young people. It's our mission for me and Christian to make sure that Dieppe young people can enjoy our sport at, at the lowest cost possible. Uh, 
The members of the board are, well, there are 18 members. There's a coordinator at each, each level with its uh, U7, U9. Uh, as mentioned, we have two full-time employees. It's myself and Christian. And the last AGM uh, was held on the 11th of May, 2022. So we were able to discuss. We've got new members uh, who joined our team. We're trying to uh, make it the team a bit younger, the, the board a bit younger. This is good. The new president is Mr. Kevin Carrier. He couldn't be here tonight for the presentation, but he was voted in during the meeting on the 11th of May. So for us, we think that visibility, that Hockey Diep Memram Cook, that, that it brings to the to, to city of uh, Dieppe and, and the region of, of Memram Cook uh, is, is major. We have 58 teams, including 12 female teams, about 900 hockey players, and we represent the city of Dieppe throughout New Brunswick and the Maritime Provinces. Even at the Atlantic level, we have tournaments everywhere. And so our teams that are in the league, they go all throughout the province, and there's tournaments in PEI and in Nova Scotia. So for us, visibility, as you can see, of uh, is this year we have new uh, hockey sweaters. The logos are similar, but the design of the, ho the sweaters is a bit different. Uh, on the photo, we put the price of the, of the uh, sweaters. So if we buy uh, sweaters for um, all of uh, the levels, it's, it amounts to about $105,000. So now I explain our achievements. We're very proud of our, our, our female hockey. The increase in the number of play, uh, female players is increased by a lot. Uh, we have, uh, have co-ed tournaments as well. Uh, uh, we have five to uh, uh, tournaments in total. Certainly in the last few years, given COVID, we have not been able to uh, hold all of our uh, tournaments to, to help us out. But in a normal year, it's around that. It's about five tournaments, about two, uh, 225 hockey teams come from abroad, from outside uh, to Dieppe to play in these tournaments. The tournaments are fundra fundraising for the association to help keep registration fees low. Uh, as we said, 225 teams coming in from uh, outside, they go to the hotels, they frequent our, the, the restaurants and all those lovely things in Dieppe. We have co-ed tournaments that we're trying to increase the size of the teams. We try to increase um, the, uh, increasing the camps. That's my job. I try to organize with my partners camps, elite camps and uh, fall camps. So everything that uh, goes on on the ice, it's a way for me to find the funding for my salary. These past few years, we've had more camps, so we could pay salaries. So they're not members of our association that pay for me. I generate my own salaries. I'm the only one in New Brunswick, the technical director that works full time. So I think the association is uh, lucky not because it's me but because uh, i'm full-time what has worked well for us is a 50 50 draw we worked on that these past few years to help our members to pay for the registration and how it works is that members parents so you they sell 50 50 tickets Half goes to the winner and the other half or 40% goes to the youth directly. So on $100, 50 goes to the winner, 40 goes directly to the youth to pay for registrations. And the other 10% are for fees where we have to buy the tickets and we have to pay the director to organize all that. It's a big job. And the past few years, we had a total of $204,000 and we had 81,000 was given back to youth. 
16 to 20 youth can pay for the fees for next year. And we have 58 teams and 52 teams uh, participated. That's excellent. These are teams uh, from up to 18 years old. And we had a golf tournament uh, last year. It was the first annual tournament. It was uh, created by Christian and me and our president, Mr. Carrier, to have a fund uh, for our jerseys. And we thought our youth should have quality jerseys and the last time that we bought new ones uh, was 10 years ago. Uh, they were getting used, so we wanted to find a way to give a better image of our youth. Our golf tournament had a profit of about $32,000, and it went directly to buy these jerseys, and we but uh, for U15 and U18. And after our May 11th meeting, we bought U11 and U13 for the next year. The association will help uh, with those fees with um, our sponsors. Those jerseys are very expensive. With our three seasons and COVID, the association was happy with how we kept going and it wasn't easy. But we had three good seasons financially. A big success for, if for the third consecutive year, we decided at the last uh, AGM that the fees for minor hockey will not increase. So it's been three years now that uh, these fees uh, have been low compared to other sports. They've had uh, a lot of increases. So I think it's a really good thing for our youth. With visibility for Dieppe, but we think that hockey is an important sport and we think a lot of people like it, be it in Dieppe or all through the province or even the Maritimes. For example, our girls tournament, we had 67 teams and 38 of them came from over 150 kilometers away. So we have about 15 players per team and they stay in the hotels, they go to the restaurants, they go shopping and they take advantage of what we have here in Dieppe. So it's very good for us. We have economic spin-offs in Dieppe Even with just the hotels, I think it, we brought over $100,000 to hotels, and that was only for the girls' hockey tournament. For inclusivity, it's important for us, and it's difficult when the youth come from outside, but we have programs to teach them how to skate. We have a lot of used equipment that children or other teams give us. And we try to uh, dress people as well as we can. And to make sure that people are at ease and we're no, so they know where to find uh, the arenas and we want to include everyone. So I think we do a good job with that as well. For our objectives for 2022, we want to continue to develop uh, 
feminine uh, teams uh, we think our sport is important and we want to uh, to develop more hockey for girls we have a good sponsor this year with mountain view that gave us uh, 150 dollars for each new girl so after registration so it was 150 dollars less uh, for for the young girls we had uh, three teams uh, and we had 33 new girls join us this year our second objective is to minimize the registration cost this is our biggest goal we want to have low fees uh, for the youth even those that may have some difficulties we want to, we want them to continue to play hockey and we're trying to get new sponsors for new equipment and uh, so that i can keep uh, creating camps as well we add them we're always working outside the box and the association where uh, bemram coca hockey dieppe uh, we, we have got a lot of private schools so we'll see a lot of uh, hockey groups like uh, daniel bourgeois we have uh, east coast ice of Gary Cormier, a sports academy those are our competitors for our camps so we're always trying to think of new staff camps for defense uh, or different ways uh, so that we don't compete with them directly just to find new ways of doing things for our tournaments we do we're doing really good work we have good quality on the ice we have organized tournaments for teams to come to from everywhere we even called saint pierre Miquelon last year we had a team that wanted to come it was a problem with covid but we're going to keep trying to work on that and get teams over here from quebec we have challenges post covid we have youth who didn't play hockey because of covid uh, they didn't want to get vaccinated uh, so we're working hard this year to try to get these uh, youths to come back and we lost some because they didn't want to register this year for those uh, reasons so we're going to try to get them back in there was uh, less uh, ice time from Monday to Thursday. On the weekend, we have a lot of teams. Uh, we have a lot of time on the ice because teams go outside to play. And we need less ice space during the weekend. But during the week, uh, our trainers, it's it's the monday to thursday it's important for them so each year we're always asking for more ice time during that period i think thursday evening we only have four times in arena agiel of course it's a challenge for us we try to have a good ratio three hours for each team but right now we can't so that's a challenge but i can mention that the ratio in dieppe is about 1.5 uh, hours uh, per team per week and we increased that to from 2.5 so we're around the standards for hockey canada right now we're not very far away and the last challenge that what we'd like to do with the associations of riverview and moncton who have their own locals right now we have a, a 
an office at uh, AGL Arena. It's just a little office with a table and chair. And uh, we have a community office at uh, the Uni complex, but we have to share. We have one for hockey, minor hockey, and one for a figure skating, one for ringette, and one for seniors. It's okay, but of course, we have a lot of files. We have a lot of things to do as well. So there's very little space there. We would like to have our own space, uh, a room as well, where we could have our board meetings, some place that would be ours. It's a bit selfish, perhaps, but I think it would be very good. The last thing, we want to thank you. Christian and I were uh, employees, uh, but we have 18 members that are there on the board, uh, president, vice president, treasurer. So you can see these figures that we have, but he's a volunteer and he has another job and it helps us a lot. He spends a lot of hours. Our uh, managers, uh, trainers are there. What I like best about my job is to work with the youth on the ice, uh, trying to develop new techniques. Some parents uh, are sometimes intense and uh, the uh, arbitrators, uh, I thank them as well. And the city employees were very lucky at AGL and UNI because the people that work there, even the Zamboni drivers, they're always ready to help us out. And they're there for the good of the youth. Every time we need something or if we have a special request, they all always help us. So we want to thank them. We're not really used to doing this type of presentation, but we want to thank the city of Dieppe with uh, help for youth. Uh, you see uh, our figures uh, and financial report. We've calculated it very quickly, but the association saved $170,000 just with post youth. If we would have to pay those fees, uh, it, it could help our children more. And we see uh, an inc we would have to increase $400 and $500 for each uh, youth. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions from counselors? Councillor Lanting. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you for this presentation. We have an, a good organization of minor hockey in Dieppe. We should be proud. With your camps, are they affordable? affordable? Better than Charlie in East Coast? because we know the camp is good for our youth, but a lot of families cannot afford these camps. So are they more affordable? Yes, they're more affordable, but it depends which one. We have a pre-season camp, uh, $160, $225, something like that. They're a lot less than the others. It's too bad because we know hockey is very expensive and some youth have a lot of talent, but if the parents can't afford it, they can't push their talents. We have partnerships with pro, pro youth. We're, we give them a lot of equipment as well, so we work with them. 
it's too bad you don't have an office in our new arena and i hope eventually you'll have an office there you mentioned it of course we're lucky in dieppe with our employees uh, be it in our arenas parks or trails we have excellent staff and i tell them in the arenas there, it's so clean in those arenas so i agree with you they do excellent work yes i went to different arenas and i'm telling you they work very well here we finish a tournament at 11 o'clock at night on friday night we get back there early saturday morning and everything is all cleaned up it's wonderful councillor budo thank you thank you for their presentation it's very interesting I'm happy to hear you have financial assistance for a feminine uh, hockey. $150 is good. How many registrations do you have uh, or did you have in the past uh, year? For girls, we increase it. This year, we had 169 girls. We had 134 last year, so an increase of 35. So each year, between the creation of Panthers, we're increasing. So for the younger ones under seven years old, last year we had a good uh, number of girls. That's going to increase in our ranks. And this year for the first time, we had uh, an 18 year old, uh, girls team so it's we're getting more and more each year no other questions so thank you very much for your presentation have a good evening Is the other group here yet? Good evening. The next presentation is the Dieppe Ringette Association with Vicky DeVoe and Frederic Deschardins. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm Vicky DeVoe and I'm president of Dieppe Ringette Association. And this is Fred Deschardins. He is our past president. So we want to talk to you a little bit about what we do. I don't know if you know about the Ringe, if you don't know what's going on about this sport, I'll explain. In Gia, Ringe exists since 1990. And it's allowed hundreds of youth athletes feminine to practice ring it. Well, it's a circle that you can play on uh, the ice. It's sort of like hockey, but it's feminine. We have a few boys that play with us, but we have five girls at, with uh, a goalie and this a circle. So the association of uh, uh, Rigged is to give a, a fun environment for the youth in our region. And we develop friendships. It's a uh, sports for girls and they become friends. And we want 
everybody to have positive experiences. Fred is going to speak to you about the past few years, our successes. Hello, everyone. Last year, we had 190 athletes that played at all levels. UA, they're six, seven years old, up to open. And most of them are in university but we have a few that play up until they're 30 years old. Uh, Vicky is a, an ex-athlete, so she could be an open. We've had a few increases since uh, the former years. The last year being uh, a COVID year wasn't great, but we saw some increase with fewer restrictions in place so we have more of a new opportunity to play we had 12 teams and we started a learn to play program so we have about 200 youth the learn to play program started this year to motivate registrations for ringette uh, lower levels so that they get to the higher levels it's important for us because like you said with minor hockey presentation here there's a lot of competition and now there's feminine minor hockey and in ringette it's a feminine sport almost exclusively but uh, we don't stop the boys from playing but the sports like that and that's how it was played in the past we try to develop the lower levels to recruit youth in ringette and then they like the sport they become good at it, and then they continue in further years and they develop in the sport in the region and they become uh, team members regionally and nationally and we have and i see you have a grant of 50 dollars per athlete too so we sent a lot of them to the canadian championships so we try to increase the base with learn to play and it's a program that doesn't cost much we want the game uh, to be uh, accessible it costs a lot of money to rent the arena there are a lot of costs and i know you help us with the cost but what tr we try to do is reduce the cost so it can be accessible as a sport but not only for people who have a lot of money in the southeast of new brunswick it's a hotbed of ring it 63 percent of the provincial ring it players come from the southeast so in dieppe it's a sport where we're really strong regionally We've had uh, provincial teams of 16 players. Maybe six of them are from Dieppe. That's on the provincial team. So we have a good representation. So it tells us we do very good work to develop the players and their capacities. So we start uh, fundamentally, we teach them the sport, to love the sport, and play the sport for the sport. So the girls in our association, they play with ring at Dieppe, but we had uh, six teams in the finals and three of them went to won championships for their division. So we're good standing provincially. We have about 51 volunteers in the association. 
we have uh, managers and trainers and uh, the past few years we had players that were in the open level girls that played ringette uh, since they were seven six years old and now they're 21 22 years old and uh, they went to university and they they play in the open level and in the past two or three years we've made efforts to get those players for them to come back to help so they can be implicated in the sport in the lower levels and those are models for us they know the sport they're feminine athletes it shows the progression of a player who can to see how far she can go and to see an athlete in in open we have a girl 22 years old and she's part of the coaching staff now and just you know we've gone to montreal we went there yesterday we went to quebec four weeks ago and those are great experiences for that person who grows up and between 20 and 24 years old that's how we define ourselves as adults so we see the development not only of the sport but of the person right to the end so we implicate them at the lower level and then the life cycle begins and that's how we want to continue with our sport and that's about it We have a technical problem here. With our challenges, it's not going to be a surprise. These past few years, I'm sure you've heard other associations have had problems with COVID. Can we play next week, next month, next year? Nobody knows. So it's hard with, with the parents, do they register the youth or not? So it was really difficult to manage. We had to cancel our annual uh, tournament in Dieppe. So we had 1,600 players per year. So it's the biggest tournament in the east, from east of Ontario, the ring at uh, tournament it's the bigger the biggest in these we have how many teams 120 teams with 500 players that come to dm even from prince edward island over 30 teams come and they go to the hotels the restaurants and everything it's good um, so we had to cancel two years in a row now Brunswick. Uh, avant, c'était sous gestion locale. Before, it was under local management, and now it's Ringet, Ringet, New Brunswick, New Brunswick, the provincial association, which will start to take that uh, program under its wing to eliminate char the charges locally and, and management problems that accompanied that. That changed how things work because before we had players with the local point of view, we had competitive players who were playing at the higher level and who would play for the associations. And we don't, we no longer have that option. So we're handling that, but it's not easy right now. So promotional activities were hard because of COVID. We wanted to go in the schools We had pamphlets made, we had a little promotional video that we'd made. We were supposed to go in the school schools during the noon hours in the gyms with little sticks and rings that are modified that will slide in the gym to so to show people what is a, a, a ringette uh, to show people uh, how you play ringette what are the rules that's a noontime activity and this has out been out of bounds for two years so it's really hard to promote the sport to get yourself out there the problem of visibility uh, everyone knows hockey. Everybody sees hockey. They all follow hockey. Even at the junior level, from the NHL level, everyone knows the rules. But with ringette, it's a little more obscure. So what we have to do 
It means you have to get out. You always have to always try to push and get out and meet young people. It's not something you can do remotely. You have to be do that in person. And it was hard. And obviously, the financial losses associated with uh, the registrations that dropped, the fact that we couldn't have tournaments for two years in a row, it was not easy in terms of the budget. So we were in a good financial situation, and we managed to absorb it. But obviously, it was not easy, easy for the past two years. That's about it. And now it's Vicky. So, to speak to you of our objectives for the for upcoming years, uh, as Fred mentioned, we want to continue to uh, really uh, uh, to promote it. Uh, we I, I hear uh, hockey people say, oh, I hear uh, hockey parents say, oh, it's hockey, it's going to be for my girls. And I see ring at, if it's often the friends and neighbors and people speak to each other and explain what the game is, when they learn what the game is, there's lots of, uh, the rules are different, but it's very focused on team sports. It's not individual. So once they recognize, if they know the game, they're all for trying the game. But it's an unknown. So we're going to push on that for the next few years. And we hope to be able to reoffer our tournament next year and with uh, the Uniplex uh, Center that we have not yet been able to use fully. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to do it, make it even larger, that we can accept even more than 120 teams. We will do it. Just to mention that uh, a tournament is in partnership with the Riverview Association as well. So we do that as uh, working as a team. And this is how we can offer a better tournament with more people involved. One thing that's not on the sheet, and I just knew once I submitted the presentation, so I don't know if there are people who are aware of it, but we had submitted something so that um, the city of Dieppe would host the Canadian champ Ringette Championships, and we, uh, we, we were successful. So in 2024, from the 7th to the 13th of April, the Canadian Ringette Championships will be here in Dieppe. And so for over the next few years, we're going to push, push, push with our ringette pop in southeastern New Brunswick, uh, ringette population here to create the best event that the, the the best championships has ever seen. And that being said, uh, I don't know. Do you have any questions? Any comments? Thank you for your presentation. So let's see if there are any questions. Councillor Le Boutier. <laughs> He pushed me, he pushed me, he pushed me to say something. Lisa, uh, I just noticed your name. I was a president for two years. So listen, uh, certainly ringette, it's a wonderful woman's sport. There's no contact at all compared to some other sports. Congratulations. The former guard, the old guard were very excited, very proud to see I have participated in seven Canadian championships to see this come here. It's 47 teams, I believe, for at least 10 years that they come. If you want to really compete, you'll be here two, three days ahead of the Canadian championship. So lots of people for a little while who want over some volunteering to make sure that it works out. So I, I hope that I wish you all, all success. Um, I'll have a week of vacation to support you in that great uh, uh, exercise. Thank you, and, great, and uh, wish, we wish you great success. I see no other questions. So thank you for your presentation, and congratulations for that championship in 2024. We'll follow that closely, no doubt about it. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Our next presentation is the Pickleball Club of Dieppe with Madame Clubet Leblanc and Marc Leblanc.
Bonsoir, M. Leblanc et Mme Leblanc. Good evening, uh, Mme Leblanc and Mr. Leblanc. Uh, and uh, you, uh, thank you for having us. You know me. I've, I've come for some things. If you want to speak into the mic, it's for the benefit of the interpreters. So, good idea. So, I'm here, obviously, on volunteer capacity and as a member of the Pickleball Club. And I help the Pickleball Club as well as the best to the best of my ability. So they've, I was asked to accompany Claudette for the presentation, and I will present, and Claudette will answer your questions. It's not complicated. So thank you for having us to give us the opportunity to present the future as we see it in terms of a pickleball in Dieppe. So, just quickly, the mission of the Pickleball, the Pickleball Club, is to develop, organize, uh, uh, and organize pickleball in in the city and for people of, of all age, of all ages. Even if you might see in your mind older people, the interest and the mission of the club is to eventually allow the entire population. We're we're starting to see it. It's starting to get taught a bit in schools, and some people are becoming more and more people are being interested in it uh, younger. Uh, so the start of the the club, as indicated in the bylaws, is to promote the sport of uh, pickleball in Dieppe in a safe and friendly environment, while protecting the assets of the association, giving the opportunity of the members to uh, learn and improve their their play, uh, offer lessons and learning clinics. That was working well before the pandemic because there were two schools available, and one school was reserved for the beginners, <clears throat> and when people the nice young pe people around us were good enough to count, count uh, to score some points. We said change schools and learn the school and learn and learn the the rules. It was very reassuring. It was very good. And uh, uh, schedule uh, free sessions and league games and tournaments. There have been some of them before, and there'll be more again eventually. Encourage high standards for safety, uh, safe play, and promote act uh, pickleball social activities within the community. Uh, especially like uh, uh, open uh, open house days uh, in 2021, uh, we took it up. Pickleball pickleball started up again in the community in the summer in the summer of 2021. There was the pandemic last summer. Uh, there was issues around Mathe Martin. There were nearly 150 members then in the fall. There was no access to schools which makes it hard to uh, start your activities again. And the recovery was late in uh, schools uh, at Namaya and McNurban since March 2020, with the lockdown at the start of uh, January, slow down the whole process. So our objectives for 2021 and maybe even 2022, uh, 2022 and maybe even 2023, is to encourage members who are interested in playing pickleball to come back to recruit new members of all ages uh, are, as our mission indicates, to continue to offer pickleball outside during uh, this summer and at the start of the fall, and to, to start up uh, uh, indoor activities as of September in the schools and organize a pickleball tur uh, tur uh, tournament, a community one, um, and, the, and, the, and the profit would go to the Jeux d'Acadie. It's something we want to do uh, again in the fall. Challenges in uh, 2022. Uh, places to play, places to play, places to play. We compare each other to the Riverview Club, the St. John Club, and Moncton. And the Riverview is well organized. But one of the advantages that they have that we unfortunately do not have is to have a site, as you will, if you will, a permanent site in the summer, in the, in the winter, rather, if we can play in the day and even some nights. That makes it easier to recruit. It makes things more regular, makes people more loyal. People are interested in pickleball at the check. Can we play at such and such a time, etc. We don't have that. And we probably won't have that within and indoors. But if we have the equivalent outside during the summer to uh, uh, re recreate that loyalty, you can't have that because they don't have enough uh, permanent fields. So we're coming back to you to get some permanent fields. And we know that Claudette and the uh, city employees are in talks 
uh, to check out the different options. We put up some examples of fields that you already presented to situate at a certain time. Kadiak has four fields, Review has two, um, and Sanidor has six, and Bathurst has eight. Uh, if we don't have a permanent court, there are uh, uh, net uh, kits, and then people uh, start to buy them. They're not so cheap. There's like $200, dollars that people buy kits. We can put up those kits in a few or five minutes and, 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 and disassemble them in, in, in under two minutes. And then you can play in places where there are lines. But it's not the way to develop pickleball. So in conclusion, uh, we're ready to pull, pull up our sleeves as a club and as members because there are new members who are interested in giving them their time and energy to the club. So there's a, 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 a certain expertise involved in terms of con building uh, outdoor uh, uh, courts or repeating for the third time. We want to make efforts to make pickleball accessible and available. It's interest interesting for all ages and everyone based on whatever uh, physical limits they have to be very inclusive and to keep maintain the uh, social aspect. So there's pickleball for the first time in Machi Marte. It's a it's wonderful weather to play pickleball, no wind. It's a uh, um, very interesting social activity. A lot of people find interesting. And our dream as a pickleball player is to have a complex that would be a unique type of complex uh, in Atlantic provinces uh, that would be only for pickleball and outdoors. So, so that we can get to that point we need a critical mass of courts to that to ensure that we develop the court uh, the sport and for us a critical mass if we don't re uh, dream uh, too far it's eight and we're really dreaming in colors it's ten if we're re it would be okay six but eight would be ideal but if you speak to others it varies between eight and ten that would be what is ideal and sufficient number of players in the app and in Greater Moncton uh, to play on at least eight courts during the summer. So Odette, do you have anything to add? Thank you once again for listening to us. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. I have several people have questions. I will start with Councillor Lantaigne. I'm, I'm, not, I'm slow learning. I'm a slow learner. It's been only been a year. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you for the presentation, Mark and Claudette. A few questions. You mentioned that in Riverview, there's permanent courts indoors. They're using a recreational center, a community center, and they can use it in the daytime, in the morning and the afternoon. And what they do in the morning is for people who want to learn how to play pickleball, really recreational. It's a little more competitive in the afternoon and one or two nights a week. I think it's Friday. It's available for people who are available. So the courts are permanently set up. There are courts that they re remove because there's an after school um, uh, daycare, but you can keep it up to late in the afternoon. It maintains, it becomes their place to play pickleball. So what you're asking for is here in Dieppe is uh, out for outdoor courts. You have access to indoor courts, but they're not permanent in the winter with the schools. So that's covered on that end. If there's no pandemic, well, it's all over, right? I agree. So that was my question. What do you see, what do you see in terms of the number of courts? I'm understanding that six would be the minimum. So now where would you see that court i know that you're in talks with uh, the city or the employers uh, the employees rather there's different uh, options but where would you ultimately see that uh well if there was a space next to the tennis courts would be great but uh, maybe there's not enough room there uh there's the people in the city who could tell us that one if there's other sites in the t in the city we're fine with that but the club, the first ideas was to have it there. It's a nice opportunity. 
is the opportunity can become a reality with six to eight courts we think yes but if there's parking problems if the if the city has other plans but i imagine that the city has other uh, property around the, the rotary might be uh, might be interested as well there's a, a last question lots of people have questions let's say that the city says we have the budget for four uh, courts you want six would you be able uh, would you want to do fundraising to try to fill in the rest or because they did this at uniplex there was fundraising basically everything we do there's fundraising you're saying that you're ready to uh, pull up your sleeve the answer is yes the easy answer is yes but it depends it depends on the construction cost for these courts and the construction cost of the courts will depend on where we put them so if it's an affordable cost and there may be arrangements to be made with the city over the course of several years maybe we can commit to generate money over the several years to repay the city the equivalent of one or two courts my uh, uncle does plays this a lot John Duguay, you might know him in Chipaga I know they're doing fundraising to build uh, courts and throughout all the um, steps squ squash Moncton started like that the city invested uh, money and uh, squash pays back a certain part of the, some part of the money for uh, a, a part of the arrangement I have other questions but I'll uh, uh, the, my questions will probably be asked by other uh, uh, councillors. Councillor Le Boutier, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. In terms of communication, this is my question. So let's say the uh, courts are at the school in the summer and I want to play. How do, what do I do? How do I start if I want to play? Or Mathieu Martin, or I don't see any website. I don't see any presence on Facebook. How do your members communicate? There's an internal list for the members, like where I learned yesterday that we could start to play tonight because I'm a member of the club. So the secretary sent an email to everyone saying it's available. But the club has slowed down a, a, a bit with the pandemic. And the club, it's its intention to organize an AGM to seek out new people not throw anybody out but to add some new blood if anybody wants to be replaced and ensure that we communicate better and that we find a system indeed okay on friday afternoon can i go play behind marty martin uh do i have access to a net because the net is not always there constantly there that's why the club has an arrangement with the city okay so there's at least two evenings reserved for the club and one um morning during the week uh, uh, last year was uh, Monday Tuesday and uh, the interpreter missed the other day uh, beyond that there's no possibility to ensure uh, that we can play even if you have a net you can show up and there might be people who are using that court so uh, there's something to do that we have to do to for to ensure our development with the city uh, to see if there's more availability that a club might take on and make it more open for people who want to uh, start up and just play for fun with a small group of friends may i ask you i just want to clarify what you just said i want to understand so the summer you only have two days during the week where it's guaranteed for pick up all you can't go seven days a week in the evening or after the school is done it's not a question of the school we don't have uh, volunteers, we don't have permanent staff. So ex unless you had a permanent net, you could call three friends and say, look, we're going to go meet and we're going to play pickleball. But you can't do that unless you have your own net. And you were saying that it's about $200? Yes. And uh, where are the risks of theft? Oh, you can't leave it there constantly. No, no. No. Thank you very much. But a permanently uh, uh, permanent net is not so expensive. Uh, but a permanent net, you have, you have to leave it there. But you do have to supervise it to some degree. Like the Saint Isidore Club, it's open. But there's a little reservation system. You reserve if you want to play on Thursday afternoon or 
uh, Tuesday night, you reserve via platform, and you can reserve a, for a small group. You can leave it open, and you go there. And if ever you have, if you have not reserved and you show up, you can play if there's nobody there. But it does require a bit of organization. We can't have it because it's volunteers that have to put in the nets and take them out. Even if it doesn't take all that long, but permanent nets allows people to go when they want. Thank you. Councillor Gaudet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I have a few small questions for the six courts that you spoke of. They might be all be able to be at the same spot. They have to all be in the same spot to create a critical mass, especially if we have activities like tournaments or open houses, it's, 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 it's better than everybody there. And for leagues, do you charge fees to be a member? Yes, before. Well, the way that worked in pickleball, it was a price every night that you played. It was a, a, a fee. So this year, we decided I do have a membership card. Last year, because of the pandemic, we didn't even charge. There's too many people who need exercise for mental health to just leave it open. But in the spring, uh, we'll have an AGM in two weeks. And at that point, now we have to charge fees. The, ch the fees that we were charging in the schools is $3 every time you came, you come. And if you pay for the room, you pay to have the gym. So that's it. Another, a last question, or one more question. If something you speak a lot, I, I would be interested in seeing it, actually. Somebody approached me last year who said, uh, it, it, it happens on Wednesday nights and uh, Martin, Martin, uh, Martin Martin. Uh, it, on Mon uh, Monday, it would start. And then and Wednesday, it would start next week. I, I, you can go see how it works and play. Come people stop with their biking and they stop. So what are the hours on Wednesday? It's always six to eight around six o'clock. There's somebody there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tourjon Roy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It's really great. Thank you for having presented a second time. What I really like in what you're saying is what respect to develop, developing the sport. And certainly when we think of that and we have dreams and we'd love to have eight to 10 uh, courts, I often understand, well, is it just a trend? But I think that what's important is that to develop the sport. You mentioned that you're raising funds for the Jeux d'Acadie. Well, uh, when will it become a demonst demonstration sport? Oh, we're working with them. Well, that's exactly what I want to hear. At any rate, you have a great project. And yes, we hear you. We know that it's a, it's a wish. And we, we think I think that the council will do what it can uh everything within his power uh we hear you well in your uh, the way you just talk about it talk about development the way it will impact our young people it's a beautiful sport councillor brido thank you mr deputy mayor so i'll throw the throw it back to paul if you want to register and try it out i will hop in with you it's been over a year, year and a half that uh, Odette and Danny are, are twisting my hand, my arm to go learn how to play pickleball. And my objective this year is I will do it. Thank you, Claudette, for the presentation. And yes, I will try to register. We even have pallets. We, we give you the, the, the pallets as you're starting. People don't know how to play. Will I buy a, a pallet? It doesn't, it's a sport that's not expensive. If you have a pair of sneakers, you pass through some pallets. And you try it for a couple of weeks to, to try it out. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And based on the questions that we've received, I think you can be sure that we'll have some nice discussions. We'll be talking about the budget. We're there to continue the discussion as well. Thank you. So the next presentation is the uh, Dieppe Tennis Club with Serge Langes and Dorina Saint-Onge.
Just thinking of things. Okay. Okay, ça va. Bon, ben, bonsoir tout le monde. Good bonsoir. evening, everyone. Bo good evening. We've already been presented. Uh, that's, been, that's been done. I would like to state that I am the for, uh, ex president. I was the president last year, and uh, Irina took up the presidency for this year. I'd like to start by saying we're doing well. Our club is going well. It had not been going well about a year ago. I have to confess that for lots of reasons, there was COVID obviously, the 2019 uh, season in 2010, the executive had a lot of challenges and for lots of reasons. They set things aside and at the start of last year's season, it was a pretty significant deficit, infrastructure problems, things to repair. This evening, I'm going to do a little summary to show you that we were able to meet the, the challenge and we're in a good con condition and we got to go even further. There's a, something rather specific with this club. Uh, some sports have it, some sports have it. Tennis is a sport for everyone. It's a family game. Uh, families come and play on Sundays and, uh, su and Saturdays especially. For adults, we have courses for adults and for young people and teenagers. And it's also attractive uh, both for men and women. So it covers, it's, it, cover, it really covers a significant proportion of our population in the city of Dieppe in terms of access and interest. What uh, is our mission? We look like uh, a bit like all, all the sports on that front. The uh, mandate is to promote the and develop the sport of tennis within the city of Dieppe. Uh, you should have on uh, you should have a, a, a backgrounder that goes into details uh, I'm just gonna give you the big picture so uh, how do we uh, fulfill our mission by offering uh, courts for our, our, our adults and, and young younger people and, and people who are less young and uh, courses we also started a, a schedule for our for young people and a, a social program as well tournaments and recruitment is done pretty actively two things to remember is to be efficient and equitable it's important for people even a beginner like uh, mr brido with pickleball that you're comfortable and that you're welcomed when you start this sport and we do well in that sense and we're efficient as well we have good relationships with uh, the city managers and we've worked on that especially last year we reinforced our relationships with the city We've had a new agreements for the club. Uh, if you have any questions, I can answer them later. But people, Jonathan Lagredan, Rafos, Pauline Cormier, Sonia Béliveau were excellent with us. They work with Jonathan. And without them, we wouldn't have succeeded. They were wonderful. They were always supporting us. So the managers of the city were wonderful. What were our challenges? Financing. We were in the hole. We owed money to the Moncton Club, River, Riverview Club. We had bills to pay. So we didn't know what to do. Firstly, we decided 
we would have a, a new program to get funds and we got uh, $7,000. And if you go to our courts now, you'll see that businesses from here were really good with their sponsorship. We worked to put back uh, together fees for the club so it could be more accessible for people. And we had initiative to attract families. We started selling water bottles, and that kind of stuff that helped us. And we renegotiated with the bank and Rogers. We were paying fees uh, and financially we recreated our program. So Today, we have almost $17,000 in the bank. It has had uh, spin-offs with respect to tournaments. It's good for the city to have tournaments, to let people know that we're there and that we can have tournaments. But everything that was done with infrastructure and to get back on our feet financially, we financed the two tournaments this summer and they're all through the Maritimes. We have championships for youth from 20 to 30 years old in July. We have an invitational in August for all the Maritimes in infrastructure we needed new courts and we modernized them so we have the best ones the best quality in Moncton now so we had the tour tournaments for this year now we modernized our clubhouse we had pigeons that was a real problem and we found a, a chalet for our equipment and we got a new patio. So the infrastructure is first class now. And let's hope it'll continue to be good for us. With new members, last year, we really worked on that. We increased our membership uh, to 40 46%. So it really helped our finances. And we see that people are interested that we give uh, classes. We have social activities, tournaments. So I wouldn't be surprised that I can see another 40% increase this year. And we hired employees for the season. We didn't have enough employees and it's important for a club. Like the pickleball people said, they don't have employees. It's difficult that way. You have to rely upon uh, volunteers. So now we have, we have four employees this year. Now the provincial and federal programs, it doesn't cost anything for the city but it comes from the federal and provincial governments. And now we have two youth who are taking a trainer courses for the young kids. It allows us to do that. We were limited, however, we are opening hours we have uh, tennis at night, support for people that are working. So we have to ensure there's someone there. So we started that again. We have social activities. We have a mixed tennis on Sundays. And before I talk about challenges, I want to add that you have the opportunity, a golden opportunity now to support pickleball by 
building another court just in front of our clubhouse. They put gravel where the centenary arena was, and with respect to dimensions, I'm not sure. I think it's big enough for pickleball, but what's great about it, we can create something with the multiplex and the lot, and we have a clubhouse for pickleball if they had the courts there. So they would have a foot on the ground for the pickleball people. They would have a part of our clubhouse. We could share it. We could enlarge it somewhat. And finally, we could add toilets and showers like they have in Moncton. It's hard to have a tournament in the afternoon when uh, the toilets are, are full. It's not interesting for people that come from outside and they have those facilities at home. We have the sewer system, the water, the, the building is there. So we could put in good toilets. And then we wouldn't have the homeless people anywhere coming off the street. We could just close up at night, it would be safer. And we would have a collaboration between the two. We're ready to work with them. I'll hand the mic over to uh, Dina now. Good evening. I'm going to talk to you about our challenges. Of course, like Sal mentioned, we don't have toilets and we don't have water. So it's difficult to have tournaments. We only have one table, one toilet that's portable. We have to take them over. It's not obvious. We've been talking about an interior complex and we're daydreaming, but we always wanted interior tennis because the only ones that are available, they're at the SEPs at the university during the winter. Can you imagine with all the university events, uh, it's hard uh, to reserve to play tennis. People, uh, tennis players in the region, they'll go to Fredericton to play. They have an interior complex or they'll go to New uh, uh, Nova Scotia. It's not easy. We want to, to look at the safety of our members and we want se security for our members. Last year was difficult for us, but like Sarge mentioned, Tennis NB will offer training to the trainers and some of our employees will take this training in this summer and we're not the only ones but it's not easy to find students to work there are many jobs available and students have choices of jobs but up until now we're going well we'll have about four of them we want our membership fees uh, to be affordable as well. We didn't write it here, but Sunday afternoon, tennis is free for Dieppe residents. We communicate with our members on a website, tennisdieppe.com ca and we have a facebook page as well we have a member on the executive who's a communications expert and she uh, leaves a lot of messages on that uh, website so you see our programs uh, tournaments etc we always have to finance our uh, operations and events at the club of course and for 2022, like Serge mentioned, we want to increase our membership. We want to promote tennis with youth. In the past few years before the pandemic, we had a lot of events for youth. We had junior teams 
and uh, they did very well in provincial tournaments and Atlantic tournaments. So we want to work with the juniors and uh, adults as well and families. We want good installations, improve our programs and have local tournaments and regional tournaments of quality continue events we're going to have one zoomers in action something like that it's in a june they approached us to have that activity it's provincial for seniors and they'll come to our tennis courts and we have a lot of events like that that we're organizing i have another point to mention I want to talk about safety. We worked last year because we had thefts. Because street people, homeless people came during the day, especially at night. We would go there the next morning and employees said there was needles everywhere and, and it was all around the toilets. And the, the, we locked one of the toilets. And even some nights, uh, some people slept in the toilets. And now we had a theft, as you know. We have three courts on each side. We lost our lighting on one side, at the side of the Uniplex. They stole everything. I don't know how to settle that, to put a small park where the arena was. I don't know if it's a good idea because other people will come and they'll come and sleep and hang out. So we asked if pe police could come and uh, check it out. They, they stole like $10,000 worth of stuff cables and it's going to cost money to the for the city it's your insurance so security is very important if we could have a, a lot with the pickleball uh, i think there'd be more people around in the evenings i know it's quite a challenge they broke windows too we had to put plexiglass windows that can't be broken. Our shed was broken into. They uh, stole a ladder, cables for a club with not much finances. It, it is very concerning. And, and they stole our ladder to go steal the cables. Do you have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. I'll see if we have any questions. Councillor Brindle. Thank you. Mr. Lages and Madame saint -Age, good presentation. I would like to see some cooperation with the pickleball folks to see those two associations. And we have a great area to do it, but we're going to work on that and we'll look at all the details and see what's possible. It's unfortunate what happened to you with your thefts. Ms. Santos, thanks for coming here. I see you uh, walking every day. I know you're in great shape to play tennis. So have a great evening and thank you. Mr. Brideau, you can come and play tennis with us too. I'll even pass you my racket. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Mayor, 
Yeah, thank you. I wanted to speak without a mic, but it won't help the interpreter. I have a comment. Thank you very much. I'm very proud to see finally somebody is taking care of my tennis club. I used to play tennis and I was a member of the Diet Club and I was uh, working for Academie Nouvelle. And then we had great courts and they were let go. Now I want to start playing again. It's a great sport as well as pickleball. I think now we have uh, Canadians uh, that are doing very well in tennis. We we'll see that on TV. And like Councilor Pido mentioned, I would like to see a partnership between pickleball and tennis with a clubhouse for both groups. So I think we have something to work with and thanks for everything you've done to put tennis back on course because a city like Dieppe should have a good tennis club for its citizens. Thank you. Today, Sobeys signed an agreement with Tennis Canada, and they're going to create, to finance and help. And I think it's going to help us as well. So we hope that something interesting will come out of that. Thank you for your presentation. I have a small question. You mentioned that you increased your membership 46%. How many members do you have? about 84 members now. So that shows you where we were beforehand. If some people left us to go to Moncton, why? 2019, 2020, was nothing going on. But I think those people are gonna come back because we have the best courts now. People of Playtech that uh, built those they were the first to sponsor up. They gave us $500. No, thank you, and have a great evening. Now, I think we're going to take a 10 minute break. So let's start. So the next presentation uh, pilot project uh, on on-demand transport project, uh, Luc Richard. Uh, the mic is goes to you. Thank you, councillor, uh, members of the council. Uh, the last time we came to you for public transportation was at the start of the winter 2021. So the project, the uh, pilot project that's underway, we're pleased to offer you an update on it uh, based on the last past six month period. So the objective tonight is to offer up the progress of the pilot project. Well, I have to say that since November, we've been, uh, we only provide this uh, on-demand trans transport with our own provider. As you know, we started with Kodiak Transport uh, during that uh, learning curve there. We realized with our own vehicles, it was more effective and efficient to do it with our own provider. Uh, and and just wanted to remind you of that. So also to remind you of the advantages and the, and the objectives uh, in terms of uh, uh, on-demand transportation, where there is uh, increase in destination, increase in the frequency of the service, uh, lim uh, limit um, uh, transfers and uh, the, the length of the transportation, transportation so that it's quicker, people get to their destination. We also want to extend the service area. So if you'll remember before Christmas, the over labor service was very limited, no service at the airport. There were businesses in that sector asking for things. And there was all reasons that we're aiming for that pilot project. And we had uh, hypotheses uh, that we might be able to reduce the operating costs, but not in order to reduce our uh, expenses, but to 
reassign the uh, funds to improve the service. So what we mentioned during the presentation in November was also that we were seeking to add um, uh, on-demand transportation uh, in the afternoon uh, during the from, uh, 9.30 to 5.30 from Monday to Friday, also extended service in the evening, and also the request the, uh, from the council to, ask, to start earlier than 10.30 on Sunday or after eight, uh, 6 o'clock on Sunday. These are all things that we've considered, things that we've considered. So to establish the current service level offered, the, the chart you see before you shows the uh, the, tra the public transportation service that include on-demand uh, transportation. You see our set uh, routes, 93, 94, 95, and the uh, on NTA refers to on-demand transportation. See days of the week, the hours of service, and the taxi bus that is only offered from Monday to Friday during the rush hour to help people in, in the Dover, Lake Burn to make, do transfers to 93, 94, 95. So that's the service that we have right now with the on-demand transportation. We have transport uh, service up to 10 o'clock. We didn't have that before. And be able to reduce by working with our provider and start earlier on Sunday. So I know that there were desires to start even earlier than 10 o'clock, but for the moment we've been able to have a, a start at 10 rather than 10.30. When you look at the number of uh, key, key, uh, key, uh, KPIs, key performance indicators, number of customers is important. We constantly see more uh, customers each month. Uh, now those st stats, uh, in terms of the trips completed, uh, we've seen an increase and increase since January. That's normal. It's a new service. We also know that we have a new via, uh, bus, uh, a minibus, that is accessible an accessible minibus with 11 passengers. See it uh, driving through the streets of Dieppe, and so it creates some interest, and that's led, led to an increase in in, in interest. Uh, and we see the trips completed. We for the moment we have uh, about 50 trips per week, about uh, uh, 10 trips done in the evening. And Saturday, about 60 trips. And on Sundays, about 45 trips. Uh, that's how the um, uh, trips are distributed each week. Another hypothesis that we had at the start of the project, we said that we might be able to reduce the number of kilom kilometers, uh, total number of kilometers uh, 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 covered by buses. And with the uh, statistics and the increase in demand, what we see is that we're not really saving many kilometers. So uh, that's the value of having a pilot uh, pilot project to validate your hypotheses. We don't necessarily have here, uh, that it, well, let's compare distance in terms of uh, kilometers traveled uh, by our on-demand uh, public transportation, transportation compared to if it was a set route. There's not a lot of savings. The only savings is on Sunday. Uh, there's about 10, uh 75 kilometers saved or so but based on the popularity it, it might increase the number of kilometers traveled but what's important to note that even if the kilometers is the same the service is better because people don't have to do any transfers uh, they can go to point a to b more quickly so there's advantages on that side but it's still interesting we thought at the start that we might be able to save on that front but we see it might not be the case in terms of number of kilometers traveled. So the uh, one of the more important uh, statistics is uh, is what the clients are using the service. Think of the service. What we see, we're very pleased to see this. We have a lot of people who are, are offering comments, clients who will make a give us a mark. And the, the assessment, as you see, is very high. 4.8 out of 5. That's great. Uh, but to say what we're looking for, uh, it's, uh, it's really up at uh, uh, high expect, uh, expectations. It's January to April. It's 23% of the trips received in an evaluation. And we're very uh, satisfied with the participation level, too. I would add a few slides related to public transportation, related to our set routes. That's not necessarily connected to the theme for tonight for uh, on demand tra uh, transportation, but there is a link. Uh, we also compare the performance of our uh, trips 
uh, of our routes, we have uh, more detailed uh, uh, statistics in Kodiak transportation. Uh, Kodiak transport, it's uh, uh, the number of uh, people coming on. Uh, we have two, uh, 93 is mostly for Champlain Street. We have 232 people coming on per day, over 40 uh, 15 hours of service. And on Saturday, it's 151 people coming on for 15 hours of service. Then in, in the 94, uh, for, for Route 94, there's 93 per day for 12 hours of service. We only go up to 6.30 and not 9.30 as the 93 does. And we see the 95, it's a little bit more busier. Uh, it has a little, a little more ridership. And that one is uh, serves Amiro and Fox Creek. So that puts into perspective uh, the use of our service. It's uh, significant for us to know that. In terms of respecting the scheduling for set uh, routes, we ask Kodiak Transport to know what's the performance of those uh, routes, because we want to make sure as people who use those three routes, they have to meet, they have to uh, do transfers. And uh, they go to Champlain, those three uh, routes converge at Champlain, so they'll have to do a transfer to either the university or downtown or other places. So it's very important that those buses can follow the schedule that as it is assigned. And what we've seen with the increase in Dieppe, uh, growth in Dieppe and increase in traffic during rush hour, also the addition of, of um, uh, the lights that we it, it put on the Champlain Yamiro, we see that there's an, it has an effect on the length of uh, bus travel time. We have to take that in consideration. Just want to make sure that we have a sense of what's going on right now with those trips, with those routes. We, we don't have high performance with uh, two of the three uh, routes. There's standards in the area, and we're working with Kodiak Transport to try to find solutions and alternatives. So it may well be that in September, that is the next date, there could be changing comings at the start, they're changing, uh, coming at the start of June with the routes for Kodiak Transport. But the next date for potential changes to routes would be the 4th of September. So we're first seeing potentially with the, uh, the back to school period and the back to coming back from the school uh, from the summer period to add uh, another route uh, to make route uh, changes to the routes to, uh, for better performance. So if we come back to on-demand transportation, transportation, there's been lots of improvement. I have to uh, highlight that it's not just me behind this. There's lots of other people involved. There's Anik Kenyi, who's working hard on this project, who's helping me a lot to get these stats and such things. And one of the things that we were able to uh, see uh, was uh, reservation calls. We have a, a call center, Answer, three, answer, answer 365, that, is uh, taking calls on their end. There's a learning curve as well because it was all new for them. Now they're doing two or three other ta cities that have on-demand transportation just like us. So they're a bit more used to it in terms of uh, the accessibility of the minibus. I mentioned this. The increase in the number of uh, routes and, and clients and to optimize the combination of routes. We had a, a, a pilot project. We, we were working with the transit and what we've seen uh, we we set we changed some parameters and we see that there's an improvement and we're now we're at a point now we're seven eight nine people in the, in the in the bus compared to where we were it was one in, uh, where we started it was one and two we see that the capacity has increased and this is thanks to as I was saying the work uh, that we uh, collaboration that we've had with everybody I now close out uh, well a couple challenges that we have had. And there's the vehicle capacity, of course. We have one vehicle, it's a minibus, 11 passenger minivan. It's a pilot project still. So we just have one vehicle. The plan B is that we have uh, six passenger vans. So we're working on a plan to see if we're gonna continue with this. We have to ensure that we have other uh, minibuses as well. We also have our provider capacity. Our, when, they st when the provider started, it was for a certain capacity. We wanna continue in 2023. With a service offering, we need to ensure that we have the capacity to extend the hours of service and for more hours over the week. And finally, it's always a challenge to connect with clients, promoting the service communication 
we're also working on that uh, Kodiak Transpo uh, to align with them, even if it's not them who will be handling the on-demand, uh, who are handling the on-demand uh, transport. They're still one of the links for regional um, uh, public transportation. So we're trying to connect with clients to promote the service they're offering. So that's basically my presentation and the information I wanted to share. So basically, I think we're on the right uh, path. Things are going well. There's things to still that needs to be settled, but I think that there's a growth challenges actually, growing pains that we're thinking of adding a second vehicle for on-demand transportation at the same time. We're almost at the threshold. Good news, like, uh, and our intention is to come back with you for information related to related, uh, potential changes in September and to make decisions for 2023 at that point. And I'm available to answer your questions. Do the council members have questions? Madam Councillor Goodbu, thank you. Congratulations. What seems to be a, a great success. Uh, lots of great progress there with that project. I like the direction it's going. We see that in this fall, as you say, there, there, there's potential for increase, increase in its use. I like the project's philosophy. I like to see its growth. What is the plan in the fall for communication plan, the strategy to increase uh, the use of the system? Certainly, from the way I see it, the more people know about the service and know that it's available, I think the more that there'll be a demand for it. I understand you said properly, you can't create too much uh, demand until you can fill it. So we now have the capacity to maybe take up more demand. So what's the plan, if you will, so how do we attract people? Is it just uh, organically or is there other things to be done? As I mentioned, we're trying to work with Kodia Transpo to use their communication tools. Uh, they have a, a writer's guide uh, that's published three or four times a year. They have been very great with us to date uh, in terms of social media. They've done a bit of promotion for us, not too, too much just yet. Uh, to ensure that we're able to uh, accommodate the growth. So we're collaborating well with them. So we hope that for them to work with us, the Kodiak transport clients are on-demand transport uh, clients and vice versa. So it's not the same service provider, they're the same clients. So we need to offer those clients uh, the information on the range of transportation options that they can use. Uh, two, on our end, we haven't established a specific plan yet. I know there's things that have been done uh, with respect to our communications, uh, lovely communications uh, in terms of social media. And it's an, uh, we also developed uh, pamphlets that our drivers pa uh, give. Uh, we uh, put some uh, 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 ads in the bus sh shelters where people take the bus. There's initiatives like that that are continuing. Certainly, like lots of other initiative, word of mouth is important. If pe it's people, it's the people themselves who share the information often. We're trying to do things, but we don't necessarily have a specific plan to do a big uh, launch next year. Is there a blitz coming? There's no blitz coming up, no. I think our minibus, uh, the minibus, it, uh, lots of people wonder, what, what is that? So I should say as well, uh, thanks to our communications department, that prepared uh, panels for the bus, uh, the 94, 95, and 93 buses. There's uh, a sign that speaks of the uh, uh, transportation, on-demand transportation. We've done some uh, visual elements with branding, and I think it's uh, starting to bear fruit. Certainly this summer with the uh, hot Wednesdays, uh, as the recreate department will be present, we'll certainly go seek out some clients that are not actually currently using the, the bus. We want to seek them out as well. So thank you very much. Uh, good news on that front. We got a report today from Kodiak Transpo that's saying that the increase of the use of the student passes from young people 12 to 17, it's increasing considerably. That's a good sign. Thank you. Councillor uh, Councillor Le Boutier. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Exact, I had exactly the same question and you answered my question. So thank you very much. Councillor Boudreau. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It's really wonderful news that we're foreseeing having a second minibus. 
there is great usage and it's uh and with the increase in uh um the cost of fuel lately maybe people it will push people to maybe want to use the bus more than a car and we can increase the service somebody uh, mentioned it to me at some point that there was a bit of a, st a stigma attached to the fact of using the bus and i never realized that well i always told myself that it's safe in dieppe to take the bus but apparently there's some parents that are worried to let their children ride the bus without them so i don't know if we can uh, have a communication campaign on that front to show that it's safe to take the bus here in Dieppe. Yeah, things are do well, doing well all throughout uh, big cities. There's uh, children taking buses, uh, and there's no problem. And this is a small town, and it's in developing fast. But it would be interesting to have some communications on, on that front. That's a good observation. Thank you. I'm taking note of it. I don't see any more questions. I have a comment that a citizen uh, gave uh, offered up uh, lately. We want to increase the users of the uh, bus system. Uh, he says, in the eastern part of the city, Lake Burn, there's students in the college, the uh, the piloting school. Every day, they take they, they see them taking taxis to go there so i don't know if there's a means of sending a bus uh, down there I, I know that we've spoken about it a fair amount quite a bit but the taxi bus i know that it goes and gets people and brings them to the other bus stop other bus routes but it, 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 at the at the route at the bus route and it brings them back Yes, and at Montessot College, we went there, our driver and our uh, taxi bus provider we has gone there to speak with the owners and the, the, the people at the head of it uh, and give them pamphlets. And there's different cohorts who ride it uh, sometimes, but they have access to the service just like uh, the residents. Okay, thank you. So that seems to be all on that front. So next item, uh, next presentation on the garbage pickup and disposal with Eric Dubé. Hello, Mr. Good evening, Mr. Dubé. Hello, uh, uh, good evening, uh, members of the council. I want to take the opportunity to tell you it's the National we uh, Public Works Week this week. Unfortunately, with the pandemic. We haven't been able to do uh, things for three weeks and we had people visit our facilities. Uh, so next week we expect to do something a little more, not grandiose, but uh, with a little more bite than we had before to show what happens in the backgrounds of our, our lovely city. That being said, we go from uh, the, the, the uh, the, we're going to not speak about the front the front of houses. This presentation is a preliminary uh, uh, presentation. I know you'll have lots of questions. I don't have all the answers for you tonight. So there we are. Uh, well, it will happen like that. If you have any questions as we go, uh, I'll take note of them and I'll come back to them. So uh, the so the history, we had a contract with Pharaoh that was ending the 30th of June, 2022. That is ending. Uh, so we did a, a, a joint uh, uh, approach with the uh, city of Riverview, and we went to a public offering, and we grant uh, it was displayed on 17 uh, January, and we granted the contract to Miller for five years, and based on the modifications for special um, pickup, there's a slide ahead of the other one. Here we go. So, when we got uh, when we went to tenders, we got an alternative offer. So the contractors submitted an alternative offer, 
And once you approve the Miller contract, we were able to open up the tender uh, for an alternative tender. It gave, and it gave us a, a reduction of 3.2% on the price. And this leads to savings of 130000 over five years. What comes with the alternative offer is we go, uh, the garbage collection goes from three days, from four days to three days. So we had to get the consensus of Riverview as well. They had they were on a four-day schedule and they go that down to two. So on their end, it had to work for them and it had to work for us. So the reason that we're here a little bit later is uh, in terms of their uh, uh, steps taken with the council was a bit after us. So Riverview will be Monday and Tuesday, and we will be Wednesday to Friday. Before that, it was we uh, Tuesday to Friday. The difference also is that Miller, the 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 garbage cans won't, won't be on the on the street any longer. There's more vehicles coming in, so that we can uh, uh, finish up with the proper uh, time frame. It's a win-win formula both for the residents and for us operationally. It, we, we saw the winter that we had, one day of less of uh, garbage by the side of the road. It's great for everyone, especially for uh, uh, snow removal. And uh, for with that, um, here we are. So with the special pickup as of the 1st of July, in this alternative offer, you are, you can have one bulky item each week yes with your clear garbage it's every two weeks so let's say you buy a washer dryer you can put your neck one week and put your washer dryer when it's clear garbage uh and then and two weeks later you can put out your dryer it's a good alternative that we were perceiving uh, that we saw very favorably uh less um uh, objects uh encumbering your 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 way uh in the spring uh we uh, fewer people picking up so we have to pick up it gives 26 opportunities to put something by the side of the road uh also if ever every two weeks it's not enough uh we have uh egg the echo depot 360 uh the residents can also go there if they can't wait for two weeks there's a couple in the region so they can uh speak with they can go on the sit on the website to uh, to see when when that's possible. So now, I think you'll see. There we are. This is it's a bit hard to see, but you see the comparative map compared to what we had Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Now you see the redistribution. You see it better than me, actually. So, uh, with that. Uh, I think that's the last one. There's a communications plan that's, that we're working on with the, the communications department. We expect to do the Diep, uh, publish the Mag in June with new maps. I won't say new rules, but the new options that we have for our residents in terms of garbage collection and garbage pickup. So basically that's what I had to present if you have any questions, uh, we can answer your questions. Uh, Councillor Lantain. Oh, his, his mic is open. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Dubé, for your presentation. I have a one question. It's a current question. Uh, is the is there a clause in the contract that would allow for a readjustment based on the cost of gas? Gas is at two dollars. I imagine at the price that they offered. I don't have the documents in front of me, but yes, there is a clause on adjusting uh, gas prices. They can adjust adjust based on gas prices. I don't remember the percentage, but I can come back to you with that. Okay, great. And my last point is. It's an excellent service. Instead of having special collections uh, to have the opportunity every two weeks, the only issue for me there be in terms of recycling. Uh, we put our large objects uh, weeks uh, uh, and, uh, and there's lots of things that are recycled. 
I presume that it have an impact on that. But in terms of the service, it's really, I find it really great. It works for me. And based on my memory uh, for the adjustment, adjusting the price of gas in the contract, I think it was a dollar forty or a dollar fifty. That's in the contract. So, so the adjustment is based on that. Adjustment done at the end of the year, a year, or based on the average price of gas, the adjustment is done every six months. Uh, it'll be done in July, uh, July 1st with, with two bucks. I don't expect it'll go down in the summer. Maybe in the autumn it'll go, in the fall it'll go down. I can find it for you. No, that's fine. No, that's okay. That was mostly, that was mostly my question. Thank you very much. Councillor Le Boutier. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. My question is regarding the start. What is the start in the con the hour, the time in the contract where they start? We don't really have. We asked to put the uh, uh, waste out outside before 4 a.m. They say they leave around 5 or 6 a.m. That's around those times that they want to be on the route, the road. So there's not really a definite defined time. I found that this year there was some trucks at 5 a.m. Quite often on my street, it wakes me up. And it was a question I had. Listen, if that's what it is, it's what it is. But nonetheless, with Miller, one of the discussions we had that they expect to leave their uh, warehouses is around 5 or 6 a.m. But I can uh, get to you more specific times if you'd like. Thank you very much. It's great work. It's great to see the results. It looks really good. Uh, good work. Councillor Goodboo. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I presume that the mod potential modifications to our... Uh, 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 can we uh, uh, consider the larger uh, terrain with the law and governance? Is there something in the contract that will allow that? Based from just based on my memory, no, but I think we can discuss with them, but we can change a few things with the contractor if they agree with what we want to accomplish. As I understand it, with the white book, uh, white paper, we don't know quite know where we're going. It's a five-year contract. I, I can I can check. So there may be some ver ver modifications as of January. He's doing his good work, but I don't want to disrupt him too, too much in the contract also because there is a development in town, although there's units that will be added. So there's unit unit prices to, uh, by the kilometer. And certainly if we have to go to new territory, you have to take all of those uh, elements into consideration and our discussions with the contractor. It, uh, it might be the approach then. Uh, we have unit prices in the contract that allow us to, to open up that, those discussions. Uh, thank you, very, thank you, perfect. Councillor Boudreau, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Councillor Lantin uh, made me think uh, with terms of recycling. Is there some way of encouraging people to throw out uh, uh, large items uselessly uh, we will maintain uh, the street treasure to encourage people to to go seek out uh, objects. Yeah, yeah, that continues. But once again, with our communications department it is something that we can send some messages around that. Maybe organize events to encourage people to give a second life to some materials, some objects. Thank you. No other questions. So I uh, thank you, Mr. Dubay, for your presentation. Thanks for your time. For our last presentation, financial results, first quarter of 2022 with Stéphane Thériault. Good evening, Mr. Thériault. This is a long meeting for you tonight. Uh, it's been three hours. I'll tr we'll try not to take too much of your time. Thank you.
because this is the first time I present uh, okay. virtually. Okay. Okay. Si vous voyez mon écran. You'll see my screen. Essentiellement, qu'est-ce que je veux vous présenter ce soir? What I want to present tonight. It's the first time I do this. This is the first quarter results, January, February, and March. It'll show you the tendencies that are development, uh, surpluses and deficit, and to see if there's anything to correct or not. So it's uh, just to see what's going on right now. And I tried to show a budget and try to make them real. And I'll explain as I go through this presentation. With respect to revenues for a general operating budget, we had initial budget of 63 million and we've had uh, expenses. Exactly what we expected. So expenses are up to 1 million up until now. A little bit more details with respect to revenues. There's not much that stand out. Everything was as uh, predicted with revenues. You could see a surplus of uh, 30,000. It's a minimal for the time being. With respect to debt expenses, we can see the surplus, see the first line salaries. We have a 14.69 million. And now we're at 4.72 million. So we have a, a surplus up until now. It's a little bit higher than what I thought. But we had accepted the 2022 budget. We had a new hires, maybe 10 of them. And they're not uh, taken up at the beginning of the year because human resources has a, a few difficulties uh, trying to find the right candidates. And some uh, of create a surplus of 700,000. And then we'll see if this tendency will keep going. And I'm thinking of William Book right now, or see if where it's going to uh, go down like the weather. And we had uh, the cost of water, too, and capital operations. Uh, the debt service and budgets to date. I didn't think uh, there was anything uh, that we went over. So there is not a surplus or deficit. It's at the end of the year that we know exactly what the amounts are to be used and sent to uh, the funds. So we're going to pay interest in June and November, December, we pay debentures and interest. And that's when we'll know. The other expenses on a budget of 14 million were at $63,000 surplus, but within that, we have deficits. About 300,000 the first three months. With transportation and snow removal and the price of gas going up. So we have a deficit on that side. So we have 600,000 surplus for the other expenses. And for the most of it, it's for the timing. It's hard to budget everything compared to the real, but there's nothing really to mention now. For the the fund for water and sewer, 
Any questions? Or you can continue now. With respect of uh, water and sewer budget, this is a summary. So we have a surplus of about 60,000 and expenses 260,000 surplus for 320,000 for the first three months. A few more details with respect to revenues. It's for the, uh, the water fees. So we have more units than we expected. We have a little detail here in that the two mini home parks now have a water meter. So when, it, but when I did the budget, but they were fixed units. So my budget and fixed budget, it's a deficit, but with the water, uh, I'm, I'm ahead. So there was a fixed price for residential and there is about 450 units with a fixed and a replaced by units. The other two, water sale and other revenues, as, uh, as I, I mentioned, with respect to expenses, the first uh, line is the salary. We have a surplus, the same explanation I gave to you a while ago. For external commissions, we have about 30,000 for uh, extra units. Operations, it's very difficult to have a budget that will be balanced. We might have a few. Fewer expenses, and maybe at the end it can increase by the end of the year. The other three expenses operation capital, debt service, and other debt expenses. That's what I wanted to present to you tonight is to tell you what the tendencies are, where we've arrived uh, up until now, and then I'll give it to you again. Uh, at the end of June or beginning of July, what the latest in September. And then after nine months, I'll present the results to date. October, November. And I can also present uh, what we expect at the end of the year. So that'll be for the third meeting that so i'm ready to answer your questions councillor le boutier thank you deputy mayor i have a question it's not about your presentation it was uh, good to see it uh, to get a general idea of where we've gone for the interest rates uh, we've had increases the debentures that we have for our projects, is that fixed for the duration of the project? The majority in the past could be renewed, but every year we renewed them. If the borrowing was on 15 years, we renewed after 10 years, but at the last meeting last year, we paid 350,000 cash to renew it. However, the future, for the future, the province made adjustments and all borrowings are for the entire period. So there's no way we can buy it back or renew it. So we have a risk of increase of interest then. Yes. The next one is 2023 and then 20, 30, 31 or 32. But in both cases, 
I think we're going to pay 100% of the renewals. Thank you. Any other questions? No questions? Therefore, it's nice that we're controlling a budget. Uh, so I thank you for your presentation. And this adjourns our meeting of presentations. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>